couple of weeks ago in our time in, um, in John's gospel, we kind of we zeroed in on a glorious promise, really th- the glorious promise of this whole, this, this whole first part of John's gospel, the, the, the prologue, the first 18 verses. This promise was the centerpiece. Verse 12, but to all who did receive him, received Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. This, this is the gospel right here. This is, uh, it's, it's an announcement of, uh, of wonderful good news against all hope that God welcomes you to, into his family in Jesus. He welcomes you without reservation. He welcomes you w- without distinction to all welcome he says, in Jesus Christ. And so in Jesus Christ, that's the welcome that that we as a church give to all of you here this morning. We are welcomed by God into his family. We welcome you here with us today. I'm very glad you're here. Now, when you hear a promise like that, how does it sound on your ears? Do, do, Do any of you find a promise like this hard to believe? That God welcomes you, that he wants you in Jesus Christ. You know, we talked about a, a couple of weeks ago when we were first looking about, at this, how this, th- this promise right here, this aspect of John's gospel, that God wants to welcome you in Jesus, it might be the hardest part uh, of the whole story to believe. Not, not the miracles, not the resurrection, you know, not any of that stuff, but this promise right here that God welcomes me. That's, that is the heart. That, that's the part that's hard to believe. That's the part that really, it just seems like it can't be true. And it's not, you know, because we don't know Jesus or, or his story or any of that. It's because we do know ourselves, and we know, uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, we, we don't deserve this. We don't. Really, I, you could call this the problem of guilt, would be another way to put it. Really, what I would call the biggest barrier between us and really accepting on a heart level this truth of the gospel that God wants to welcome us in Jesus is guilt. Makes me think of uh, an insightful article that Bruce actually shared a couple years ago, so you might remember this. It's called The Strange Persistence of Guilt. It was written by David Brooks in the New York Times, and and in it, um, Brooks is actually reflecting on the work of a professor at the University of Oklahoma who observes that pretty much everyone these days in our culture is guilty, feels like a burden of guilt about some things or other things, but nobody knows what to do about it. Here's how he puts it. He says, we, li- we are living in an age of great moral pressure, even if we lack the words to articulate it. Whatever donation I make to a charitable organization, it can never be as much as I could have given. I can never diminish my carbon footprint enough or give to the poor enough colonialism, slavery, structural poverty, water pollution, deforestation. There's an endless list of items for which you and I can take the rap, for which we can feel guilty about. He continues, we live in a world in which we're still driven by an inextinguishable need to feel morally justified, like, you know, we're in the right. And yet we have no clear framework or set of rituals to guide us in our quest for goodness. Worse, People have a sense of of guilt and sin, but no longer a sense that they live in a loving universe marked by divine mercy, grace, and forgiveness. There is sin, but no formula for redemption. Religion may be in retreat, but guilt seems as powerfully present as ever. Have, Have you observed this trend in our culture? Have you seen it reflected in stuff you see on social media or see on TV, conversations with friends? Do you know people who feel guilty but know know what to do about it? Have you felt this weight in your own heart? And really, I mean, the article doesn't even get to what I think is probably the biggest burden of guilt that most of us carry, which is totally legitimate guilt. Guilt for stuff that we know we've done that was actually wrong that we didn't want to do, but we did it anyway. People we've hurt. Uh, intentionally and then regretted it. Relationships that we have ruined or soured, maybe not 100% our fault, but we have carried some of the blame for that. What do you do with that guilt? The guilt of willful sin. 
You know, I think of um, Lady Macbeth in, in Shakespeare's play. I had to read this back in like 10th grade. Did anybody else have to read Macbeth? A few of you? Okay. You know, for me, there's this scene in the play that I think of basically every time when I think about the problem of willful human guilt. It's, it, it's Lady Macbeth when she's sleepwalking in her room. She's being observed by uh, her maid and a doctor, and she is frantically trying to wash this phantom blood off of her hands. Do you remember this? Lady Macbeth had committed a murder some weeks ago, and she got away with it, basically free and clear, so she thought, but she couldn't get away from her sense of guilt. And in her sleep, you know, when her mind is unguarded, she's, you know, not trying to put on a show or whatever, that is when it's too much for her. She stands up, she goes over to the basin that's in her room, and she starts washing her hands obsessively over and over through the night till they're raw. Here's what she says. Who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? Out, damned spot, out, I say. She's trying to wash her hands, and she lifts her hands to her face. Here's the smell of blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. She's trapped, right? This is, this is the burden she's carrying. This is the burden that will ultimately break her. Have, have you ever felt that way before? Do you, do you feel that way maybe even this morning, that, that you've just done stuff that can't be forgiven? That your hands are fouled by your sin in some sort of way that all the perfumes of Arabia will not be able to sweeten? Have, have you felt that way? You know, I think that Shakespeare is actually making the same observation hundreds of years earlier that David Brooks makes in that article that we're all guilty. Lady Macbeth stands for all of us right here. Lady Macbeth with her bloody hands trying to wash them, that is an image of the human condition, the human heart, the, the guilty heart that we all carry within us, whether we choose to acknowledge it or not, whether we choose to try to drown out that guilt with entertainment or busy activities or all of that deep within us, there is a sense that we are not right, that we are messed up. What do we do with that? It's really the, uh, the beauty and the glory of the passage which is set before us this morning in the Gospel of John. We're looking at the next section in John's Gospel. We're looking at verses 19 through 34 of chapter 1. And in these verses right here, in this scene of John the Baptist by the river, we hear him announce to us the solution to the problem of guilt. In this passage, we really what we discover is the basis for that glorious promise that, that John already made earlier, that we're all welcomed into God's family freely without reservation. How does that happen? Well, it happens through the means that John the Baptist describes right here to anyone who will receive it. And he gives that through a simple a uh, powerful invitation, behold the lamb, behold the lamb, look at him, look at Jesus, the lamb. He wants us to, to stop looking at ourselves, to stop looking at our, our bloody hands, which we're frantically, you know, trying to clean ourselves, and he wants us instead to look at Jesus, to look at the lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and to know that our hearts can be at rest in Jesus Christ. That's what he wants us to do, look at Jesus. So we're going to do that this morning. We're going to look right now. We're going to start at verse 19. It's interesting, this passage actually starts with a very different question, and then John turns it to look at Jesus. So we'll start there, verse 19. And this is the testimony of John, John the Baptist, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? So if you'd been reading the gospel straight through here, you would feel a very sharp shift between verses uh, 18 and 19. We're starting at 19. We ended with 18 last week. There's like a chasm between those because 18 is the end of the prologue, the introduction to the whole story of John. Well, right now is where like the action, the story begins. This is when you have characters, you have conflict, dialogue. We're like, we're swept into it now. It's kind of like that moment in the Star Wars movies you know, where the, the yellow letters finally fade off into the distance, the camera pans down, and there's, there's a Star Destroyer, and there's little spaceships going around, and we are, we are in the story now. And 
the action here, it is driven by one simple question, a mystery really, especially for the people who are trying to investigate this. Who is John the Baptist? Because that, that is the John in this verse. I know it's confusing. This is the Gospel of John. He starts out by talking about a guy named John. They're not the same John. This is John the Baptist, not John the writer. And, and the questioners in this, in this passage, they're really just, they're sent uh, by their leaders with one simple task, figure out who this guy is. Who are you? Now, if you've read the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, you probably have somewhat of an answer to this, to this question already. John the Baptist, you know, he's the famous, the famous eater of locusts and honey. You know, he wears the leather out in the wilderness. Surprise, he baptizes people, you know, hence, hence, hence the name. And chances are, um, the original readers of the Gospel of John probably had some sort of an answer to this question too, because John the Baptist was actually a, a pretty major figure within the Jewish world of the first century. There, I, we see this in a, in a very interesting story in uh, the book of Acts. You might remember this from when we went through it a couple years ago here at, here at church, but um, Paul is, is traveling up in the city of Ephesus, which, you know, is almost a thousand miles north of Jerusalem, and he encounters all these people that they're, they say they're followers of John the Baptist. They don't know anything about Jesus, but yeah, we're, we're like disciples of John the Baptist, and this is decades after John's death. So it just kind of shows how widespread his influence was at this time, which makes it very likely that some of John's first readers, these, you know, first century Jews, would want to know this answer too. Like, who is John the Baptist? Uh, what is his relationship to Jesus? How does he fit into that? Well, John gives us the answer here, but it kind of takes a while for the people who are asking the questions to actually see the answer. You'll, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Verse 20, he, John, confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So notice here, this is, this is incredibly formal language uh, that, that John the writer is using to describe the statement of John the Baptist right here. It's like courtroom language, deposition language, you know. Uh, he, he, John could have just written, he replied, which maybe would have seen, seemed a bit more normal, but instead he states, he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, which, which basically is t- like telling his readers, John the Baptist held up his right hand, put his other hand over the Bible, and then he like threw in a pinky promise to really seal the deal. I am not the Christ, which would probably be a huge relief to his, his questioners, um, at least initially, because Palestine at this time, it was a very volatile region. It's a volatile region almost any period of history, uh, time period of history that you look at it, but especially right now during the time of John the Baptist, uh, revolts were very common. So were um, Jewish splinter groups like we see with the um, Essene group at Qumran, the people who, who gave us the dead, the dead Sea Scrolls. There were movements like this happening at the time that caused quite a bit of unrest, which is probably why these Jews were worried about it. And most of these movements really focused on two ideas, the kingdom of God and the coming of the Messiah or the, the anointed one, which is how Um, you could translate that word, the Christ there. That's what it means literally, someone who has been anointed. It carries the idea of kingship with it, the idea of Old Testament hope. And and based on their reading of the Old Testament scriptures, the Jews at this time basically uh, expected the Messiah to be this person who's been set apart by God to do God's work of restoring the Jewish people. That, That was the Messiah's job, hence the revolutions and the revolts. There was a guy named um, Simon the Star, and another guy named Judah the Hammer, which are awesome names, but they were both revolutionary figures who became, who came before John, and then after John, both claimed to be the Messiah. Both of these figures gathered uh, bands of of followers around them. They had a bunch of disciples and stuff, and both ended up starting revolutions, little little revolts, followed by years of turmoil and, and violence. So if John claims to be the Christ, these, these questioners are thinking, these are, these are the sort of problems that we're going to have. And that's why we need to send this delegation out here to figure out who is John, what is he saying he's doing out here in the wilderness, baptizing all these Jewish people who are flocking to him, and is he going to be a problem for us? Are you the Christ? No, John says. So relief. But they still don't really have an answer. Verse 21, and they asked him, well, what then? Are you Elijah? Now, that might seem like a really weird question to ask because, you know, Elijah died about a thousand years before this. But actually, no, if you remember, Elijah didn't die, right? He was carried off into heaven. 
in a chariot of fire, is, is, is what we read in the Old Testament. And there's also, in Malachi, this somewhat cryptic prophecy that was really widely circulated at the time that many believed to mean that Elijah would return in the body before the great and powerful day of the Lord, maybe come back in the fiery chariot or something like that, but he would launch kind of this, this coming of God's kingdom. So the Jews are wondering, well, is this who John thinks he is, the second coming of Elijah? Keep in mind, too, that both Elijah and John the Baptist had similar tastes in fashion. 2 Kings 1.8, he, Elijah, he's talking about here, wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather around his waist. And then Mark 1.6, now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, right? So we've got two dudes both rocking similar goat hair leather ensembles out in the desert, kind of preaching repentance, acting, you know, like prophets and all that. Are they the same guys? No, I am not, John says. Discussion closed. So then they ask a third question, are you the prophet? Now, again, you can tell probably by the capital P as it's translated here, this is a reference to a specific figure, again from the Old Testament, this time from the book of Deuteronomy, who was um, foretold to come before the coming of the end times. This prophecy way back from Moses, again, widely circulated, a lot of speculation about it at the time, and once again, John replies in the negative, no. Have you noticed John's answer is getting shorter here? It's like... (laughs) It's kind of comical when you read straight, straight through it. First, you've got, I am not the Christ. I am not. No. You know, it's just like, it, he reminds me of Bill Belichick at a press conference. Have you ever heard <laughs> the coach of the Patriots where he's just like, no, no, next question, you know, onto the Bengals or, you know, whatever it is. That's what it's like here. So it's very frustrating if you're the one answering the que- asking the questions. Verse 22. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Again, it just makes me think of uh, reporters at a Bill Belichick press conference. Like, we got to write a story. Can you give us something? Throw us a bone, please? So he does, sort of. Verse 23, he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Once again, we have an Old Testament reference. And once again, this, and, but for different this time, this is one that gladly, gladly John takes upon himself. He says, yes, this is who I am. I'm the one Isaiah was talking about. And this would definitely not set the Jewish questioner's hearts at ease. This, this quote from Isaiah that John applies to himself uh, right here, in its original context, it's actually um, a prophecy concerning the return from the exile. Um, so many centuries before this, the Jewish people had been captured by invaders, taken away to a foreign land. And right here, uh, Isaiah is saying that they're going to be coming back. They're coming home. This is a, 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 a promise of salvation. Make, make straight the way of the Lord. In that original context, it was calling for a literal improvement of the road system in the desert to the east of Jerusalem because he's saying, make it straight, make these roads good because guess what? You guys are going to be walking back on these very soon. God is going to be faithful to his promise, his covenant. He's bringing you back. It's a promise of salvation. And without a doubt, that's how John wants this statement applied to himself to be heard right here. Uh, like Isaiah, John is promising an imminent, an imminent return from exile, this time the ultimate exile, the exile of sin, our exile from the garden. He's saying, get ready. Salvation is coming. Make those roads straight. Repent. Messiah is on his way. So in essence, John is saying that my entire purpose, my role here on earth, I am a preparer capital P. I I am the opening act for Messiah. I'm not the main show myself. I am just here to shine the spotlight on him. He says it himself in verse 31 of this passage, for this purpose I came, baptizing with water, that he, that's Jesus, might be revealed to Israel. It's all about showing, revealing, shining the spotlight on Jesus himself. Now, for the questioners, that's really not answer enough yet, at least for some of them. Verse 24, now they, or you could actually translate this, now some of them, meaning not necessarily all the, tra- all the questioners, but at least the ones asking this question here, had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? Baptism at this time was an act of authority. It was really actually an act of repentance. Jews wouldn't normally get baptized. Baptism was for non-Jews who wanted to become Jews. So why is John baptizing these Jewish people? Where does he have the authority to do this? 
It's a critique embedded in that. Are you saying that we are messed up, John? Really? This is going to be the first time that the Pharisees show up in the story right here, but they play a very big role later on. So we're going to kind of save more information about who they are for later. But already you can tell just in the question right here, they are very big on this idea of authority and who has the right to do what and when and how they can do it. That's why they asked John, why are you baptizing? What, baptizing? what gives you the right or authority to do this if you're not any of those people that we already asked you about? John's answer Listen, guys, you've got way bigger problems to worry about. Verse 26, John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one who you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. It's a pretty amazing statement that John's making right here. A Jewish tradition at the time required that the students of a rabbi basically serve as their personal servants. Rabbis weren't actually paid for their work, but they did have the advantage of their students kind of meeting their needs. They would cook their food. You know, they would keep their house clean. They would help them get from place to place. You know, basically do all the stuff that a, a household slave would do except for one task. They would not remove their sandals and wash their feet. That was the, the one task, and this is actually written in, in Jewish law from just a little bit after this, that was expressly forbidden for students of a rabbi to, to do. It was just too lowly for them. And I, and I get it. I mean, think about it. Roads, roads at the time were just dusty. You had animals walking on them, you know, leaving animal stuff behind, sweaty feet, walking them on all day. I mean, these rabbis were not enjoying the weekly pedicures that Bruce and Earl enjoy at, <laughs> at Luscious Nails on 38th and G every Tuesday. They do it together. It's kind of cool, but, you know, th that was not going on at this time. These teachers had some rank, nasty feet, so, you know, you wouldn't make your students do that. Now, what's crazy here is John singles out this one task that was too low for the students, even of the most noble rabbi, to do for him. And he says, this task isn't below me. It's above me. That's how high status this one who is coming is. I'm not even worthy to do the lowest of lowly tasks for him. No one is. And the very next day, this rabbi comes walking along the riverbank, in sandals, we presume. Verse 29, all the way to verse 34. And this is where John really shifts the question that they've been asking all along, the wrong question, into the right direction and gets them to ask, who is Jesus? Who's Jesus? The next day, he, that's John, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came, baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. He said, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water, that would be God, said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and borne witness, again, very formal legal language, that this is the Son of God. In this section right here, in this, this paragraph, John points to the solution to the problem of guilt. And he does so with one simple command, really the, the invitation that summarizes John's life message, his purpose as a human being on planet Earth and God's planet, it's all for this, as he puts it, to tell people, behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. You do this. You get your eyes off yourself, your own sin, your own inadequacy. You, you see God as he truly is in the flesh of Jesus Christ. You will never carry the burden of guilt again because you know that Jesus carried it for you. Behold the Lamb of God who, who takes away, takes up, lifts up 
carries away would be another way that you could translate that verb right there, who takes up the sins of the world and he carries them away far, far away, as far as the east is from the west forever. That's what Jesus does. That's who he is. He is the lamb. Look at him, John is saying, and put your heart at rest. He's the one we've been waiting for. There are three reasons why John can make this claim right here. Three qualities of Jesus that he points to in this statement, which really back up this assertion that Jesus is qualified to do what John claims he can do right here. One is that Jesus is God. Two is that Jesus is human. And three, Jesus is a sacrifice. All three of these qualities, they're highlighted in that larger statement from John, his witness, his testimony about Jesus, and all three must be true if John's going to make that statement about Jesus right there, that he takes away the sin of the world, that he carries it away, all of it. You lose one of those qualities, Jesus couldn't do it. He would not be equipped for the task. For example, number one, that Jesus is God. You see this aspect of Jesus' character so clearly in that prologue of John, and then you see it right here when John links, John the Baptist links back to that prologue in verse 30. He says, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. It's actually the second time we have verbatim this statement from John in the Gospel of John. And the first one was back at the beginning, right after John the writer said explicitly, Jesus is God. The Word was with God in the beginning. He was in the beginning with God. And this right here is where John backs up that statement of Jesus' eternality by saying, He was before me. He has always existed forever as God the Son. From the depths of eternity, in either direction, Jesus is there with God. No beginning, no end. This is who the Christ is. Yet at the same time, John clearly says in the, in the same verse that he's a human. He is a he, right? He's, he's a, a man. This is a, a concrete, tangible person walking along the banks of the Jordan River who, who, who John, John could point to and say, this, this is him. This is the guy, flesh and blood. Look at him. He's, he's walking toward me. This is, this is who Jesus is, God is saying. John is saying. He's truly God. He is truly human. And, and these same two qualities of Jesus, that he's truly God, truly human, they're also seen even more clearly when John makes that next statement about Jesus and the Spirit in verse 32. And John bore witness, he says, I, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him from the other Gospels. We know this happened at the moment of Jesus' baptism. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, and this would be God the Father's witness about God the Son, Jesus, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And what John the Baptist is doing here is he's taking several different streams of Old Testament prophecy and saying that they all converge on the person of Jesus Christ. God's Spirit according to Ezekiel, and another one of these prophecies that was widely discussed at the time, God's Spirit would one day be poured out on God's people. This was was a promise to them. God said, I'm going to take your hearts of stone, I'm going to turn them into hearts of, of, of flesh through nothing less than the power of my own Spirit, my own presence with you. A lot more on this idea later on in John, especially when we get to chapter three, but the basic idea is that What it means to be baptized with the Holy Spirit is internal change, inward renewal from from the inside of your heart flowing out to your actions, regeneration, as as many Christians refer to this idea. And and what's very clear in this passage right here in Ezekiel is who is going to be the one who's doing the pouring out of this Spirit. It's God himself. He is the one who will pour out his spirit on his people. I will pour out my spirit, is what God says in Ezekiel. So when John is applying that to Jesus right here and saying that Jesus is the one who will baptize with God's spirit, and Jesus is the one with the authority to to immerse people in God's spirit the way that John is immersing people in the Jordan River, baptizing them, dunking them, he is ascribing to Jesus power that every Jew would know belongs to God and God alone. Jesus is truly God. And yet in this same statement with another stream of Old Testament prophecy involving the Spirit, John is clearly highlighting the humanity of Jesus, that he's a human being, a person. Because the, the, the other big stream of prophecy that talks about God's Spirit and how it applies to people is in the book of Isaiah, where it talks about 
God's servant. This servant with a capital S is how Jews would think about it at the time, really talking about the Messiah, who was a human being who would be anointed with God's Spirit to do God's work. The language that John's using here, it's, it's clearly alluding to that. He saw God's Spirit descend on Jesus in the, in the form of a dove, remain on him. It was his confirmation that Jesus is this servant, long foretold, capital S, the servant of Yahweh, the, the, the one we've been waiting for. And in Isaiah, it is also so clear that this servant is a human being. He's, he's, a, he's a person. He's going to suffer. He's going to be rejected. He will do God's work nevertheless, but he is most definitely a concrete, historical human being. Truly divine as the giver of God's spirit, truly human as the servant of Yahweh, this is who Jesus is, John is saying. But the most remarkable statement of all is the third quality of Jesus that John proclaims right here, and that is that Jesus is a sacrifice. Behold the lamb. The lamb. Why, why would John give Jesus that title? Why doesn't he say, behold the king? Why doesn't he say, behold the God of the universe, but behold the lamb? The word lamb would probably evoke a number of images in the minds of all these Jewish people who are standing around John listening to him when he proclaims this. And they would all converge on that idea of sacrifice. The blood of the lamb killed on the Passover, smeared on the doorposts to save God's people from destruction. The blood of the servant of the lamb of Isaiah, led like a sheep to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shearers is silent, led to be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The lambs that were slaughtered every single day at the temple, sin offerings. Jesus is the lamb, John saying. Jesus has come to die. That, that's really what he's saying right here. You know, before Jesus is even baptized, before Jesus has done one miracle, before Jesus has even uttered one word in the Gospel of John, already the shadow of the cross hangs over his life and ministry. This is why he's coming. This is what everything in the Gospel of John is pointing to, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Lamb. Jesus is God, Jesus is human. Jesus is a sacrifice. Is that how you see Jesus? Do, do you believe these qualities about him? Is this really who he is, who John the Baptist says he is right here, who John declares him to be in the prologue, who every story in the rest of this book clearly points to Jesus as truly God and truly human and truly a sacrifice for us? Is this how you see Christ? If so, then you should have absolutely no doubts, none whatsoever, that this Jesus has truly taken away the sins of the world, that they're gone, period. Every single one of your sins is gone. That, that's what these three aspects of Jesus' person guarantee. It's the elimination of sin, and you need all three. If you just had one of these or if you lost one of these, uh, he couldn't do it. Because the fact that Jesus is God is what gives the sacrifice of Jesus Christ such extraordinary value. You know, this isn't just one person dying for another person, as, as cool as that would be, like a one-for-one -one exchange. No, this is God, God the Son, dying for human beings. It, that's an infinitely unbalanced exchange. It's like you paying off your debt at the corner store with a bag of uncut diamonds. You know, or you go into your buddy who, owes, who you owe him 20 bucks and you're backing up a truck full of solid gold bullion. You know, it's, it's absurd. This is the worth of the, the death of God the Son compared to our sin. Enough value to wipe away the sin of not just one person, not all the people in this room, not all the people in the state, but enough value to wipe away the sin of the world. Praise God. An infinite being of infinite value. Yet the humanity of Jesus is also necessary because the fact that Jesus is really a human is what, is what gives his death relevance. It, it, Jesus is one of us. He's, he's a true human being. He's part of our species. And, and, and on the basis of that real 
humanness of Jesus. He is fully qualified to stand in our place, in our shoes, as our representative, the human, the representative of all people everywhere. He, he couldn't do this if he wasn't really a person. You know, the humanity of Jesus is, is what takes that enormous value of the death of God the Son and exchanges it into the proper currency. Human blood shed for, for human people, human sin. Jesus, one of us, he can stand in our place. He is given shoulders of human flesh so that he can bear the burden of human sin. How many sins are represented in the room this morning, I wonder? I mean, just think of yourself. How many, how many sins have you done over, over the course of your life? How many wrong things? How many unkind words have you said that you shouldn't have said? How many kind words should you have said that you didn't say? How many selfish thoughts do you have just over the course of a week or a day? Now multiply that over your whole life. Those are just the sins you're aware of. Think of the sins you're not even aware of. The ways that our pride interferes with our worship the way we snub people and, and wrong others in ways we're not aware of, the way that we don't give God glory and, and gratitude to him the way that we should. Now multiply that by the person next to you, the person next to them, everyone in your section, everyone in this room. This is, this is a horrible burden to carry. This is a horrible burden, that, a weight of sin just in this room that is impossible for us to even fathom. But thanks be to God, in the person of Jesus Christ, he carries it all. His humanness gives Jesus the shoulders to carry our sin. His godness gives Jesus the strength to carry it far, far, far away where it is gone forever. And that is why this is our one and singular command this morning. One application, behold the lamb. Look at Jesus. Look at the one who's human. Look at the one who is God. Look at the one who dies as a lamb in your place and know your sins are forgiven. I'm going to say it again because it's so hard for us to really believe. Your sins are forgiven. If you're connected to Jesus Christ, if you have come to him in desperate faith saying, hey, I don't have anything to bring to the table. I am messed up. My only hope is that you are really who you say you are, Jesus. If you come to him with faith like that, then you should have zero doubt at all. Your sins are forgiven. They're gone. They're never coming back. They're gone. That's it. You're not going to hear from them again. That's it. It is finished. It's extraordinary how truly liberating and life-giving this truth of the gospel is when you really understand it, when you really grasp it on a heart level. You know, we talked a little bit earlier about Lady Macbeth and how she's obsessively washing her hands and trying to get the blood off of them, but she can't. There's no soap in the world that could wash off her guilt. There's not all the perfumes in Arabia could get rid of the stench of her sin. It's a prison, really, that she's in, a prison of guilt. And that prison describes what the writer John Bunyan lived in for much of his life. Some of you have heard of him. He, he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. He also wrote a book um, called Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, which is more of a memoir, kind of his personal, his personal life and what it's like when, when he met Jesus and he really changed him. And even after he was a Christian, even after he knew these truths of the gospel in his head, they hadn't really sunk down into his heart. He was still carrying this, this burden of guilt with him, guilt for the things he had done, guilt for the sins he was still doing, guilt for the sins he knew he was yet to do. Until one day he really saw Jesus in his heart as the lamb. One day he really embraced what John the Baptist says right here and understood what it means to have Jesus take away your sins. Here's how he puts it in a beautiful passage. He says, but one day as I was passing in the field, just walking outside, and that too with some dashes on my conscience, I mean, I was feeling guilty about stuff, fearing lest yet all was not right, suddenly this sentence fell upon my soul. Thy righteousness is in heaven. And I thought at once I saw with the eyes of my soul Jesus Christ, the Lamb, at God's right hand. There, I say, as my righteousness. So that wherever I was or whatever I was doing, God could not say of me, He lacks my righteousness, for my righteousness was right before Him. 
I also saw, moreover, that it was not my good frame of heart that made my righteousness better, nor yet my bad frame that made my righteousness worse, for my righteousness was Christ, Jesus Christ himself, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The invitation of John in our passage for every single person here is to see Jesus like that. To see him as he is, your righteousness, the lamb, the one who is human and carried your sin, the one who is God and paid for your sin, the lamb who died for you. Look at him. Behold him as he truly is and put your heart at rest. Pray with me, please. Father, we think about Jesus and what you have done for us and what can we say but thank you. Thank you. We don't deserve this. We don't deserve your love. What you have done for us in Jesus is is glorious uh, beyond what our minds can even grasp. But we receive it with gratitude. Thank you, Father. We worship you for what you have done for us what you are doing in us, and what you you will continue to do in us and through us. The work of your spirit, the work of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.